Hi, everyone. Wow, we have so many people on tonight. So that's amazing. And thank you all so much for joining us um, for today's webcast, which is all about Oregon's Fisher and Martin, as you can see from this very cute graphic I have here. Um, to introduce myself, my name is Allie Fisher, and I'll be your MC for tonight. I'm the Wildlife and Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Associate for Oregon Wild. I'm honored to introduce our very special guest tonight, Dr. Katie Moriarty, a research scientist with the National Council for Air and Stream Improvement. I would also like to include a land acknowledgement in this space. I would like to offer gratitude to the land itself and for those who have lived here in Oregon since time immemorial. I would like to acknowledge the continuing presence of indigenous peoples on the land today, as well as historical events, including colonial legacies and wrongdoings like forced removal that have had long lasting and current impacts. However, it must be noted that this brief land acknowledgement can in no way capture the vast nuance and complexity that surrounds the history of tribes and between them and the federal government and individual states. That being said, the most important thing to do is to not only acknowledge ind indigenous people and the land, but to continue to do meaningful work by supporting them in the present, respecting and uplifting tribal sovereignty, doing research and taking action. Here's a map that shows just some of the territory, indigenous territory in Oregon. Um, and this is a really great resource to look at. Additionally, a recording of this program will be emailed out tomorrow and will be posted on our website at OregonWild.org and the Wild blog. Please do enter your questions at any time. We normally get a flood of these questions at the end of the presentation. So the sooner you can get yours in, the easier it will be for me to go through them and um, put them in order and then ask them to Dr. Moriarty. Then finally, our raffle will still be open into tonight. So if you decide that you'd like to enter and win some of these great prizes that I have pictured here, um, please feel free to do that after the presentation. Lastly, make sure to RSVP for a webinar on February 2nd with Bob Bailey from the Alaka Alliance, who will be giving us the 2022 update on the sea otter feasibility study, which is the most important guiding document for reintroducing sea otters back to the Oregon coast. You can find this online at OregonWild.org. Now I will stop my screen share and pass it off to Dr. Katie Moriarty. Thank you so much. This may be the largest uh, venue I've spoken at in quite some time. So just quick sound check and screen. Does everything look okay? Anyone? Yep, everything looks good. Great, thank you so much. Okay, so typically I provide scientific talks to a broad audience of scientists. And uh, rarely do I get to interact with so many, over 150, 96, 196 of you at one time. So this is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, this talk today is going to be about some species that I care a lot about and have done a significant amount of research on. And my past is pretty dynamic. I've worked mainly in California, Oregon, and Washington on a variety of species. And I've been learning about some of our endemic and wild species for a very long time. At this point, I have crews that I train, including master students, and they are collecting most of the data, not me myself uh, at this point, although I do try to go out as much as I can. We're working on endemic tree voles, which are featured here, as well as carnivores, and most recently, teams and I have been working on some of our native pollinators in collaboration with the University of Oregon. So with that, I'd like to talk a bit about some of our forest dependent, rare, elusive species focused on martens and fishers as a case study. 
In this particular talk, we'll have four segments, if you will. So the first segment, I'm going to talk about the ecology of mustelids in general and use martens as an example because they're the smallest. Then I'm going to talk about Humboldt martens in particular, especially in Oregon. I'll switch to Pacific fishers and give you an intro about fishers in Oregon, which are uh, pretty exciting, and then end with a more general quick, how to identify these animals yourselves when you're in the field. So with that, you'll notice this theme of four, four parts coming up on multiple occasions. I also want to acknowledge that I don't do all of this work myself. I work with a very exceptional team of researchers and early career professionals. And all of these people contributed to that work. I, for one, am just thankful that I'm able to tell you about it. So let's start with the protagonist of our show, Martins. Martins are a very small member of the weasel family. You'll learn more about sea otters apparently in a few weeks, but you might recognize wolverines, which is the largest terrestrial member. Sea otters are the largest mustelid or member of the weasel family. And in general, these animals are throughout the world, except for Antarctica, of course. Uh, Martins as a whole, four things you're gonna learn about Martins. First, they have territories in that adult males are gonna defend a territory or a home range from other males. Similarly, adult females are going to defend their territories from other adult females, but males are trying to overlap with as many females as they possibly can. This is extremely important uh, in terms of how we think about conservation in that the territory size can vary, but only to a certain extent. Some of the martens I'll talk about later in the coastal dunes have the smallest territories in the world, which is very exciting. But even so, these animals take a lot of space. So for instance, if we take average territory size, and instead of using kilometer squared, which maybe you don't think of, uh, each one would have a territory of 500 or 1,500 acres, which is a lot of football fields. And if we were thinking about Corvallis, where I'm currently present, it's about 90 or 9,000 acres, you could fit about 24 martens. About 60,000 people live here. So that's really important. And what we found is these animals, especially martens, are defending these territories extremely regularly. So some of my early research for my PhD were using GPS collars. And to just show this really quickly, this is six months of a person getting locations. There's a wilderness area, really hard to get to. And this is two days with a GPS collar taking five minute locations. This is that same animal months later. This is an overlap between November and April. And what we found that on average, Martins are traveling around the circumference of their range about every 4.6 days. And that's published in this article if you're really wanting to learn more. And Martins are in the family Mustelidae, which I've mentioned before, and they have a lot of scent glands. So one of the reasons why we think they're moving around their territory so frequently is because they're trying to communicate to the other Martins around them. And maybe 4.6 days, as an example, is about how long those scents last. So you've already learned your first rule about Martin Fisher Mustelid ecology. They're territorial, and you can only fit a certain number of Martins or Fishers in an area. The second thing we're going to learn is that they're a habitat specialist, specifically a denning obligate. They always have their kits in cavities, often in live trees and snags that are often fairly large, but not always. They use these sites daily, multiple times a day, for refugia from predators, anything larger than them really, temperature extremes. These animals do not hibernate, they're active year round, they don't store fat and also trying to make sure they have places for, I was gonna say something really intelligent there and I forgot. But what we have learned is they reuse these sites. So at least in Lassa National Forest, this is one particular tree used on multiple occasions. And we found that this use might even span generations. 
So this particular animal, which we called male 01, was not alive in 2016. This is a new Martin using that same tree. One of the things that's really interesting and, and complicated about Martins is they have a different life cycle than we typically think of. They mate in the summer, but they don't actually implant until February. This is called delayed implantation. So instead of being pregnant for however many months, they're only pregnant for about 28 days. And they have their kits in the spring. Again, they're a cavity bending obligate. So they have those kits. They have to be small enough for the female Martin to fit in, small enough to not let any cold air in, but large enough, of course, for the kits to get out of. The female will move the kit or kits multiple times throughout the year. And then the kit will probably be about mobile, about 130 days after birth. The males at this point are bigger than the female mother and quite a burden to move up to various places. And in this winter, they are going to probably migrate away from that home range or disperse since they don't come back. So the important part about that is they need different places to put kits throughout the year. So different structures, maybe snags and live trees are great for the beginning, but once the kits are bigger than the mother and she's still carrying them, the mother needs ground places such as logs or under, this is actually a stump, a natural stump with some burrows. So now you know they're a habitat specialist. The third element is that they use a lot of energy. This particular animal moved almost three kilometers, over three kilometers in one hour. The longest distance for a Martin, about the size of a 10 week old kitten, 27 kilometers in a day. And on average, every single day, they move over six kilometers. So three and three quarters to five miles a day. In general, martins eat, and as do all of the mycelids, about a quarter of their body weight every day. So you could ask yourself thoughtfully, when was the last time I ate 100 hamburgers in a day at a minimum? And then you probably know how much work this would be to continuously move on a daily basis and have these really long movement events and to defend your territory. Martins, fishers, wolverines, they're all dietary generalists. So although they are in the family carnivora, they'll eat berries, they'll eat bees, they'll eat jam. Uh, Martins in particular, like often have redback voles, which are affiliated with large woody debris. And in general, Martins and fishers eat a lot and they need a lot of resources within their territory. They can't just go to the supermarket. And lastly, one of the things that's challenging is they don't often move into open stands. And this has nothing to do with the management type, more or less, but the predation risk, most likely. Imagine a world of pterodactyls and velociraptors and T-Rexes all outside your homes right now. As you move from one place to another, you are probably going to be very, very alert and diligent. So martens are extremely small, about the size of a gray squirrel. Anything that can eat a gray squirrel can eat a marten. There are a lot of different species that have been shown to eat martens. This is a paper that just came out a couple of weeks ago from fishers to red fox to bobcat to coyote throughout North America. And when we think about this, we need a lot of escape cover and places for martens and fishers to go. So in summary about Ecology, we learned about four elements, and now I'm going to talk about a very specific type of Martin. And since I could get no feedback from the audience, I'm just going to keep going. So here 
the point of the second feature is that we're researching using a multifaceted approach, trying to collaborate with a lot of different entities, and it's very exciting, but we still don't know that much. You've probably heard a lot of common names for Martin, American Martin, Pine Martin, Pacific Martin. Uh, in Oregon, we have Pacific Martin, hands down, Pacific Martins. This is true. Of Pacific Martins, there are two likely subspecies or groups. What we could call montane martins that live in the mountains and the Cascades and the Blue Mountains and the Wallawas, and Humboldt martins, which are here on the coast range. Humboldt martins are in the coast range, as you'll see in a moment, of both Oregon and California. But the martins in the Olympics are more closely related to the Cascades. So coastal martins were thought extinct. They were rediscovered in 1996 by the Forest Service. And since then, there's been a quick dramatic events, series of events that I'm not going to get into at all. They were proposed threatened. Uh, they became state endangered in California. Oregon banned trapping on the coast a few years ago. They, were, they became federally threatened in 2020. Proposed critical habitat came up just last fall. And they have a year to create final critical habitat. And unlike the montane martins that we're accustomed to, or at least I'm accustomed to, they live in the snow, these animals live in the coast. And then there's various elements that we don't understand. And we've learned so much, I can't emphasize. So in 2014, we had 26 locations in Oregon total, and 14 of those were roadkill, and three of those were kill trapped. So really we, we had nine detections that weren't a dead martin. And then in the last few years, my teams and I have surveyed with all of our collaborators, much of the Martin and Fisher range. This is probably one of the single largest events for carnivore surveys geographically, hands down. And from these data, the Fish and Wildlife Services and other entities have identified four primary population areas. And this is gonna change this year. We have more detections from some of our detection dog teams that we'll talk about. These animals live in a variety of conditions and it takes so much work to try to figure out where they are. Most of my field people have knee pads and most of them get very angry at some of the sites that are randomly generated that they have to go to over any conditions. Similarly, but for the most part, we get some results. We normally don't get cute pictures. This is probably a juvenile female like this. Most of the time we get pictures of other species, which is really exciting as well. So this is a gray fox, bear, you can say to yourself, lots of bear, more bear, chipmunks, bobcat, more bears. Uh, gray fox are the only canid that can climb, that's neat mountain lion and then sometimes most of the time we get blurry pictures in the dark of martins and we put out hair snares which allows us with a permit uh, to collect some genetic material that we could identify the individual and the, the sex of the animal so that is very exciting we can also do a lot more if we live capture animals, which again takes lots of permits and time and training. We take a lot of measurements and from these measurements, we've been trying to identify an algorithm such that people can identify the sex of individuals using their own remote cameras. And the key to this is actually you need a scale in the photo. Similar to what you saw before, we've been collecting GPS data on Humboldt Martins to try to understand their movements. This Martin did not go swimming, that's air. But such data allow us to understand how they're moving through areas that are apparently or appropriately too fine to get using remote cameras or other methods. This is part of the Oregon Dunes recreation area. And what we've also done using a combination of remote cameras, genetics, and radio collared individuals has tried to figure out how many they are. The only population size really for these animals on this and this side of the river, the river being here, and this is Reedsport, 
suggests that there are not many Mertens in the coastal dunes. Normally, folks want about uh, 500 individuals would be a, a population that is genetically sustaining. And I don't know if there, there's enough room for many more than 71 Martins. So this particular population might be saturated. If you want to learn more, I did an article that was written by Julia Rosen. And this is a great uh, quick note about this particular population. One of the ways that we've found a lot of our Martins and a lot of the material that we use is through detection dog teams. And I'm hoping I put in a slide. The dog teams are pound rescue animals, which are trained a little bit, but I think the handlers are the key to this success. The handlers are able to identify areas in which wind flows. And what you should really do is see a podcast by Oregon Wild and I think I'll have a clip somewhere uh, that was about a year ago. And you could learn all about pound rescue detection dog teams and conservation. From all these data, we've found, of course, there are about four populations. And what we tried to do is describe the vegetation that Martins were using. So we wrote a paper trying to compare, see whether or not spotted owls would be a good surrogate for Martins. They're not. We also recently tried to figure out where they would be using the combination of dogs and remote cameras. And we created a predicted distribution map that I think is fairly accurate, but it does not have very good representation in the Eastern coastal extent. So there are some flaws that we openly acknowledge and it's not going to show us where all the Martins are, but it's the best guess of what we have so far. So Humboldt Martins, and I'll try to keep track of time, are a subspecies of Pacific Martins, which are in Oregon. They're fairly rare. We have a population estimate for one population out of the four. Two more are coming. And there's so much more to learn. And I would typically take questions, but I'm going to keep going and tell you about fishers, because that would be very exciting. Fishers, surprisingly, are endemic to North America but they're not as closely related to Martins as you would think. They're more closely related to Tyra, which are in South and Central America. And you can see the resemblance. I did select these photos, but notice the ear shape in comparison and the coloring, sure. Martins, on the other hand, have much more of a triangular shape ear, much more of a fox-like nose. Uh, and in general, Martins are lighter, although there's color variation for all of these animals in some radiance. When you think about fishers and what I'm gonna tell you about fishers, think of an animal that's about six kilograms, about the size of a large dash hound. Not very big, certainly not. Oregon's really unique in that we have two populations of fishers. Um, in the 1960s, the Oregon Department, or at the time, the Oregon State Game Commission, decided that they would get mar or fishers from British Columbia and Minnesota and just drop them off. Why would people drop off fishers, you ask? To kill porcupines. Yeah, I don't know. From the 1960s to the 1980s, I think 1982, all of these stars are locations in which they dropped these fishers of unusual sizes. These Minnesota, British Columbia fisher combinations are, are not quite twice as big as our native fishers, but they're huge. Um, and that's pretty amazing. I would never, ever, ever, ever recommend handling any fisher with your bare hands. Uh, this caption says, of the 24 animals released, only this male let this random person pick it up and have a picture. Again, the same map, much of the surveys along the Cascades and throughout Southern Oregon have been aimed to try to find the elusive fisher. These are both native fisher and they're both males. I'm 99% sure there. There we go. Much of the work we've done with fishers also includes 
detection dog teams. And here is the promised, uh, maybe not link, but this is what you would search for if you wanted to learn more about this particular program. And I thought it was very well done. And it has a Martin and Fisher cameo. What we've done recently from my master's student, Brent Berry, is estimated the range of fishers in Oregon. These larger extents are what the Fish and Wildlife Service assumed the range was before our work. And especially in the Cascades with the reintroductions, the distribution is much less than we thought. So these data are great, a very new resource. I think this paper came out last month, maybe this month. In addition to what we call our non-invasive surveys, I also have collected, you might notice a theme, GPS data movement, very excited, I am. But these fisher ranges in the Cascades are huge. Female territory size of 25 square kilometers, male 63. One of the things about fishers, unlike Martins, is they tolerate more overlap within their same sex uh, adults. So the females overlap perhaps 20% with another adult female, whereas Martins typically allow no overlap whatsoever. But if we take these numbers, which are fairly obscure, and we think about that same analogy of acreage and football fields, 11,000 football fields per fisher is quite large. And if we think about Corvallis, which again has 60,000 humans, or more, we could almost fit three fishers, but probably not, just by area space alone. The life cycle for fishers is fascinating as well. They also have delayed implantation, but not the same as Martin's. So yes, similarly, the blastocyst implants in February, and they have a fairly short pregnancy, just like Martin's, more or less. But mating occurs typically three days, more or less, after the female has kids, which means this particular female is selecting a cavity that is just right for her, but restricts a male head from coming through. Male fisher heads are fairly bulky in comparison because she probably doesn't want to mate until she has her kids. So this is a, a quick series of the male at the bottom of a fisher den waiting for the female to come out essentially. And what we're, I'm gonna show you in I think two slides is that these males are traveling so far of a distance that they're moving between one female fisher to the other female to fisher to the other and their, their daily distance rates are insane. So waiting for the female, the male is sprinting from den to den and then just lounging around at the base maybe for hours or days. Similarly, the females are gonna move kits after they get too large for her natal or her paternal den. And then she's going to rear the kits and then the animals, the younger animals will disperse in the fall. Here's a, a quick shot of one of the challenges with uncoordinated juveniles. It's about two and a half months old. Very excitable, not very coordinated. Falls down all the time. We have more videos of more kids about the similar age. And uh, as a theme, two or three months old, which is to us probably toddler to young child, not coordinated. So the female is moving around with her kits. Similarly, the males are moving and patrolling, trying to find all of the females. And what this um, rapidly moving crosshair is doing is showing a female fisher moving throughout the landscape. And we used, again, a really fancy statistical model and algorithm to identify where exactly these rest sites are. And there's a lot of great gems in this statistical paper if you're excitable. But one of the things that we're trying to do now is figure out how and when and under what circumstances are the fishers moving through openings? How large are the openings? Uh, what are the vegetation characteristics of those openings? And what we can do to restore forests or maybe not 
Yeah, we'll see. Yeah, let's just say that's a goal. One of the things that I did allude to is, is 47 kilometers for a daily movement of an animal the size of a wiener dog is incredible. Like 50 kilometers, that's 32 miles in one day. I don't know if I can do that, but maybe I'll try sometime. So fisher movement is pretty incredible. And unlike Martins, they need larger prey. And one thing that fishers are known for, of course, is porcupines. This was why they were released into Oregon in the first place. North American porcupines are amazing. And what the fisher does to avoid all of these quills is a fisher is going to run around and bite the porcupine in the face. So this is the target zone. Basically, it's nose. It's going to try to make the porcupine turn around until it could get a quick jab and do that for such a long time that the porcupine loses enough blood to get weak, swoon, fall over. And then the fissure can eviscerate from below. A little bit violent, but we recently tried to figure out if we could survey for porcupines in Oregon. And I didn't bring up a map, but there are, there are not as many porcupines as you would hope. This introduction did a very good job. Or naturally, the forest conditions are such that uh, it's not longer or no longer suitable for these really amazing animals. But if you have any interest at all, I would highly recommend this book because it's fascinating. Uh, it's a little scientifically, I don't think it's that heavy. It's just amazing how unique these animals are. So I, I would recommend that. So I've talked about really large landscape. I've talked a lot about techniques and I've talked a lot about movement. I've talked a bit about diets. One of the ways that we use some of these other um, methods is by collecting scat. So these dogs are searching for scats and very rarely do you find a mole foot inside a scat. So we're working with the Oregon State uh, Levy Lab who have a lot of bioinformatics and new novel techniques and we're using DNA metabarcoding to see carnivore diets in general. And I'm not gonna talk about that, but we are analyzing right now Fisher diet, ringtail, gray fox, Martin, bobcat, coyote. I do have some wolf scats. Um, mountain lion. As an example, these are the locations of all the bobcats from both cameras, which are the squares, and scats, which are these stars. And we are finding that some of our predators are eating animals like Martin and Fisher. So this is a really exciting kind of novel way of trying to identify not only predicted habitat, but what the risk and competition is for these carnivores in our forests. If we think about conservation, which I haven't talked about much, one of the things that's very alarming for fishers in particular, because they're at a typical uh, a lower elevation band often associated with oak woodlands is the challenge of illegal marijuana grows and toxicants. And I would really recommend for those interested in conservation in our Oregon forests, especially in Southern Oregon, learning more about illegal marijuana groves and our legal anticoagulant rodenticides and what they do to native wildlife. And there's gonna be a really good video um, from the Integral Ecology Research Center and the Forest Service put out also this really excellent um, episode essentially that'll talk all about some of the problems in our federal lands. The other challenge with fissures at these lower elevation sites are fires. And, and I don't want to focus too much on our cascades, although fissure reintroductions are being discussed currently, but there's a population of fishers in the Southern Sierras of California. The range is shown by these hash marks here. It's almost exclusively on federal land. But in the last two years, I forget the exact number, about 40% of their range has burned, much at high severity. 
I don't know what to do about that, but I think we should have really intelligent conversations about our, our landscapes. So with fishers in Oregon, to summarize, there are two populations. One have huge fishers from Minnesota and British Columbia. The other one are native fishers who are essentially south of the Rogue River in the Klamath Siskiyous. They have huge home ranges. It's very difficult to study fishers in that not too many can fit in an area. And when you have that large of an area, you need a very large crew and a lot of money, which we rarely have. Fishers have a diverse diet. They are or have been known as porcupine specialists. They often need larger prey compared to their body side. And the conservation challenges for Fisher, I think, are as bad or worse than the coastal Humboldt Martin. And it's really hard to figure out solutions to that without a lot of conversations by smart people. So last but not least, and I think I'm right on time, we're gonna have a quick identification quiz. Oh, but I forgot about this last slide. So we learned about territories. They're a habitat specialist, diverse prey, predators. For Mertens, yes, barred owls might be a predator, yep. Now we will have key characteristics. I think there, I have a hundred slides that I'm going through in 45 minutes. So sorry about that last uh, jump. Okay, we're gonna talk about the animal, the location and what to do if you see something. So we have five carnivores that I would love for you to know about in Oregon. Wolverines, Fishers, and Martins are in the Mustelid family. I only spoke about Fishers and Martins. Sierra Nevada red fox and lynx, perhaps, are also potentially in Oregon. Very rare. If you are in an area at high elevation, like the Wallawas, you might see an animal that looks like a lynx. You're looking at their rump. This is where you should probably look. It's gonna be much less spotty. They're gonna be, lengths are gonna be much taller. And of course they have ear tufts, but you don't often see their ear tufts. There's white under the tip of a bobcat tail. That's fairly hard to see. So you're basically looking at the gestalt of their long legs, high rump, maybe tufted ears. This is probably the hardest distinction for someone that's not accustomed to seeing these animals. Red foxes also live in montane high elevation areas, um, hoodoo, um, areas of bend, bachelor, hood, et cetera. Red foxes are not often red. There are gray fox or gray cross, black, et cetera. You're looking for the tail. So gray foxes have a black tip tail, red foxes have a white tip tail. Even if the animal is gray, it could be a red fox. Here's a map of some areas where they are typically residually found. These weasels are hard to tell apart. I bet you could figure out what a tyra is now, but uh, most people think about weasels. So I haven't talked about long or short tailed weasels, and I'm not going to, but these animals are about the size of a, a really great hot dog. Whereas a marten will be a little bit more robust, like a little kitten. And we already said a fisher is more like a dash hound. So you're looking at size and shape, but neither martens or fishers have this distinctive black tip tail. So again, you're looking at the tail. Weasels often have a light cream or white colored throat patch that is very long. It takes up most of their neck. A marten throat patch could be quite small, often much of its patch, but is often this more orange or cream or yellow. Fishers may have white, but often they're at like their armpits and groin and not necessarily a chest patch. Minks are the most confused. Minks are an aquatic um, 
species, Neovisan visan, and they always have a little bit of white right under their chin. They're also often swimming, which you will rarely see a marten or a fisher swim at, but they can. Uh, mink have somewhat um, webbed feet. Wolverines are often mistaken for badgers, most often mistaken for hoary marmots or any type of marmot really, uh, because you're already at the top of a, a high expansive mountain and you've probably hiked for a very long ways and you see this really bizarre animal in the distance and it's almost always a marmot. But wolverines have this white stripe, not like anything else, no stripes on their face. So you're looking at the face, the tail, the rump, the body size. So if you're thinking that you're seeing an animal in a blur, you're almost always looking for the tail and the head for a mammal or for these mammals rather. You can get really, really good at figuring out your quick as a lightning flash image by birding. So I would highly recommend if you have the time or the energy, getting a pair of binoculars or getting a bird feeder, watching out for um, salmonella and cleaning your bird feeder quite well so you don't kill pine siskins and uh, see if you could identify different birds. And that will make you excellent for anything in the field. You can also learn all of your tracks, which are a little bit more complicated, but not so much. Your cats and dogs have four toes, your mustelids and your bears and your raccoons. Your skunks have five toes. Uh, so you could separate those apart really easily. And then the shape of those toes and how the foot pads are aligned will help you. If you are taking pictures of tracks, which are a definitive way, always try to have some sort of ruler in the picture and try to get prints from directly above like this. These are Martin tracks. This is a Wolverine track. Very same shape and identical shape, but very different in size. As well as getting the picture from straight up, also try to get the gait, which is the how the animal moved. And that is extremely distinctive for all of these species as well. I would not recommend you pick up feces in general, but if you did, you'd probably want to wear gloves or a doggy bag like you normally would for an animal and put that in a paper bag and dry it or freeze it, but don't take it in and out of the freezer. You also need a permit to get hair samples if you're doing uh, any sort of non-invasive surveys by the Oregon Department of Fish and Game, but this is another great way to identify what the species are. So in general, you're going to look for key features on an animal that you see in just one second. Then when you're done getting excited about how you just saw a mink or a marten or a fisher, oh my, you're going to talk about where it was, get UTMs, take a snapshot of your phone that has a map on it. If you can get any evidence like photographs of its feet, its prints, if you see a roadkill, take a picture of that with a ruler and then document everything and put it perhaps in iNaturalist or talk to your local biologist. And if you see a coastal martin or a wolverine, just let me know. So those are five species of carnivores that are quite rare in Oregon that you can help identify. With that, I will stop talking and answer your questions. You can feel free to email or call me. And I, I get a lot of emails. So if it's important, write me more than once. And with that, thank you for all of your time. This was really fun. Thank you, Dr. Moriarty. Really appreciate that. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Danielle Moser. I'm the Wildlife Program Coordinator for Oregon Wild. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, Typically for our wildlife uh, webcasts, what we do is have our presenter do their presentation. And then I usually jump in for like a five to seven minute presentation about our wildlife program, how you can get involved, conservation measures we're taking um, to address these issues and to, and to really make sure we have policies in place that are protecting and restoring all of Oregon's fish and wildlife. 
Um, I'm going to make an executive decision, though. We have so many great questions that have come through because we have so many people on this webcast. So um, I will just put up um, my I'll put my email in the chat if you all want to reach out to me, have questions about our wildlife program or want to get involved. Um, I will say the most important thing when it comes to wildlife conservation is having public engagement. Um, we do a lot of work at the legislature, whether it's Congress or at the state level or in front of the Fish and Wildlife Commission. And it's just really important in order for them to, for decision makers to know how important these issues are to Oregonians, um, to have that public engagement, advocacy. Um, so if you are interested, please do reach out to me. But instead of doing my presentation, I'm just gonna say, Ali, I think we should just jump into questions because we have so many and I wanna be mindful of everyone's time and try to end at seven when we usually uh, are trying to end. So thank you everyone. And Ali, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Awesome, thank you, Dr. Moriarty. That was such an amazing presentation. Um, I'm gonna go right into the questions though, because we do have so many. Um, so the first question is, how can I create habitat to encourage fishers and martens? That's great. Uh, to create habitat, some of the key elements that you'd want to promote <clears throat> would be getting trees as big as possible in general. So that would um, uh, just be time. Down logs are also really great. And those could be brought in to say an area. Uh, people have tied logs together with chain and tether to make a larger log. And uh, cavity rot fungi only can occur in living trees. So these animals live in cavities, which means you cannot create a cavity that a martinel fisher use in a snag. The tree has to be alive, have a disease, let that disease ruminate for about a hundred years and then have a pileated woodpecker essentially excavate a hole. Wow, so it seems pileated. like very specific conditions, um, but just having down logs and other habitat is really important. So the next question is, are martens cannibalistic? The map shows predators um, and you also had martens listed there. So I think that's just a clarifying question. Hmm. Um, uh, martens are carnivores. Mm, they may eat other martens, but I hope not too frequently. I would guess that a, a male martin could eat a, a different female's kit. Okay. I think that would be quite rare, but it could happen. Yeah, I think they're referring to, I think one of the maps showed you had the predation, like they, the animals, species that <laughs> predate on Martin is what I think they were referring to. And I think you had, you had um, Fisher, you had the whole list of species, uh, and you had Martin at the bottom. So I, yes. I had the same thought. I was like, oh, do Martin eat Martin? So yeah. I see. Yes, that map and Marie Martin's paper. Uh, yes. A Martin could kill another Martin, and they probably have a record of doing so. Mm -hmm. Good to know. Um, the next question, does the article about reed sport population suggest wildlife bridges? Oh, like uh, trying to create wildlife bridges across Highway 101? That would be interesting. Yeah, the challenge, one of the challenges with the Oregon dunes population is that the land to the east, just on the other side of the highway, is largely private or urban. So that would have to be a really big bridge to get them somewhere to a landscape in which there could be a, a thriving population. I think that's a challenge we should look into. And if you want to learn more about wildlife bridges, I would look at the I-90 Snoqualmie Pass project that the Forest Service has been doing, because that is one of our biggest wildlife connectivity projects in the world. And it's amazing. Oh, awesome. Yeah, good to know. Um, let's see, the next one. Are, are there also stoats or are mine in Oregon? What is their range and do they compete or overlap with martens and fishers? Yeah, so stoats in Europe, New Zealand, elsewhere are the same as our short-tailed weasel. Although our short-tailed weasel and the Stella Arminia are much smaller, like 
I don't know, like five nickels worth. They're 13 -y, a little bit bigger than a least weasel. Uh, their range is pretty much everywhere from the Corvallis Macdon Forest to the forest lands. They might compete. I think Martins would compete more on stoats or ermines, as you call it. Ermines actually a coat color, which is that white phase into a shift. Uh, if you want to look at the Martin Ermine interaction in Hatagui, which is an island which rogue detection dog teams also work in, uh, that's an endangered little short tailed weasel okay. that the Martins are probably annihilating. Mm -hmm. <laughs> gotcha. Um, why are Martins not protected in the mountain areas? Why is trapping still allowed? I can't answer that. <laughs> Uh, it, it's, uh, I don't know. Um, I, there, we should probably promote all practices that allow people to get outside if they're sustainable. The key being, yeah, sustainable. Um, let's see. Where along the central coast are humble mountains? Um, well, you could find them all throughout the Oregon dunes. Uh, one place in which people see them quite a bit is the Wax Myrtle Campground, as an example. And I would recommend camping on the coast and keeping your eye out. All right, keeping an eye out for these very cute critters. Um, I was just enjoying your presentation with all of the amazing videos. I'm sure everyone else was too. Um, so my next question is, how successful have the Fisher reintroductions been in the Olympics and Rainier areas? Hmm. Yeah, I've got feelings about them. Uh, they're, the monitoring they've done following post reintroduction in the Olympics, Rainier, and now the North Cascades National Parks have been a little lackluster, in my opinion. So it's hard to say. Um, I hope that if Oregon decides that we are going to reintroduce fishers in more places, that they follow more of a, a longer term scientific trajectory and monitoring trajectory so we can answer that question more directly. Fishers still exist in those areas, whether or not they're doing well, no one can tell you. Right, just need more science around that, I guess. Um, Next question, do fishers circle their territory in the same way as Martins? You showed those amazing graphics. Yeah, I don't know. I think they're a little bit more like Tyra, less like Martins and Wolverine. And we have those data so I can find out. They almost certainly also move throughout the perimeter to mark their territory. But I don't gotcha. know how in how many days. Okay. Um, next question. Just going through them as quickly as possible. Uh, why did the state want to get rid of porcupines? Porcupines eat trees. They also destroy cars. But I think it was the trees. I wasn't around in the 1960s. But yeah, that would make yeah. sense. Um, now there are far fewer. I know, very sad. <laughs> um, next question Are you or do you plan? to incorporate DNA air sampling. Um, this person has read that it's a newer technique and it seems successful. Uh, DNA air sampling might be helpful for some applications. I think with the rarity of these animals and how much it costs. So like for instance, every sample we process with eDNA is about $80. So if we have a thousand samples, that's insane. So in order for us to have a good sampling effort and you'd want a high sample size, it would probably cost $800,000. So no, I'd rather hire people and pay people to have jobs. That's a fair point. Yeah, that's very expensive. I didn't realize how much that was. Um, next question. Last November, this person saw a fisher during midday in Diamond Peak wilderness area. Is it unusual for a sighting during the middle of the day? Uh, I didn't get into that, but no, not necessarily. So in the summer and uh, 
probably all early fall, fishers, martins are gonna be eating say ground squirrels or birds that are mainly available during the day. For martins at high elevation in the winter, they're eating primarily snowshoe hare and northern flying squirrel, Humboldt flying squirrel now. So they are mainly active at night. So in the winter nights, in the summer day, with some variation. Good to know. Um, next question. Could you speak more about the threats to the species, especially how you see climate change impacting their populations and habitat? Not in a short period of time. Uh, climate change, of course, will affect our snowpack, which Montane Martins use pretty exclusively during winter. That's a, a really nice thermal, uh, snow caves are thermally fantastic. Um, I think I touched on fires and we'll have to think about how other threats affect these species, but it, it is, uh, not to be unprofessional, really hard, it's really hard. And I think the, the best thing we can do if we think about, sorry, I'm rambling now. Okay, three things. Everyone can try to figure out where they are. Uh, we could also help by making large term, like large scale plans of where we want animals on the landscape and trying to do land swaps if we want them in places in which they are not. Because manage the land for native species is not something that is everyone's goal. And then for individuals, you can get involved by being on the board of say a local land trust, like a, the Greenbelt Land Trust, for instance, to have land locally for the species that you are passionate about. Good to know. Um, next question, are there fishers in Idaho? This person may have seen one in central Idaho forest. True, yes, there are fishers in Idaho and they are extremely common in the East Coast. Um, so you probably saw a fisher if it looked like a fisher. There are also martens in Idaho, depending on where you were. Okay, I'm sure the end of your presentation will have helped. That was some great information. Um, I just have a few more questions because I do want to be mindful of everyone's time. Um, is there data on how far the youngsters, I'm guessing of um, both species, typically have to disperse in order to have their own territory? Yeah, so often they will disperse as close as they can without getting essentially beaten up by another male or female. So for both species, I think the average is somewhere between five and 10 kilometers away, not very far, but they will make extremely long distance movements, um, 80, 90 kilometers, 100. They often star and try to investigate all the places and then finally make a move. Yeah, I was definitely wowed when you shared all the information about how far they travel in a day. That's just incredible. It's um, insane. Before you leave, could you please put your email just in the chat? We have some folks um, asking for it. Um, mm -hmm. So that would be great. And I'll give you a, a minute to do that. Ah. Done. Awesome. Thank you so much. It is just about time to go. So I do want to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, and hopefully we got enough questions down. I feel like I was just peppering you with questions the whole time. So thank you for doing that. And thank you for such a wonderful presentation. Um, it was so informative and lovely. And we have a lot of um, comments coming in about just thanking you for the great presentation. So it was a great turnout today as well. So yeah, no, that was a lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you for your time. We really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Bye, everyone. All right. Thank you so much. I'm going to close the webinar and have a great night, everyone. Bye.